We are treated to our first view of the Kame or Turtle House, which will soon serve as something of a community hub for much of the series. And there are some good gags here, like Kame Senin wondering about the suitability of Chi Chi's name, which can mean breast, in case you didn't know, and Kame Senin failing Chi Chi's test, followed by the giant band aid. And in an amazingly wonderful twist, the mystical Basho Sin was thrown out because Kame Senin spilled wonton on it, so he promises to go there himself, but only after getting Goku to promise that Bluma will let him touch her breasts. The character of Arale loved Japanese monster characters, so it's no surprise that a baby Gamera makes a cameo appearance here to transport Kame Senin to Mount Frypan. It's just a bit odd, since he's never seen or mentioned again. But of course, the big payoff of this section of the arc is the first unveiling of the Kamehameha, probably the most iconic attack of the entire series, and it cements Muten Roshi's status as something more than just a dirty old man. It also wipes out the entire mountain, but they find the ball in the rubble. And while it took Muten Roshi 50 years to learn the move, Goku blows up their car with an impromptu Kamehameha immediately. Bluma makes Oolong deliver on the promise, which is odd considering how willing she's been up to this point to do similar things for seemingly less payoff. Oolong gets his revenge by letting the old man do a Pafu Pafu, or Puff Puff, basically motorboating. Gumo gives them a new car and they're off again. Also, Toriyama quite clearly sets up the next story arc by having Muten Roshi offer to train Goku, and Goku promising he'll take him up on it after the quest is over. It almost seems out of step for Toriyama to be even that forward thinking, but we'll see a few more instances of such a thing over the course of the series. The next town doesn't really have much to analyze. The bunny suit that Bluma was forced to borrow from Oolong freaks out the locals because a rabbit-themed gang is terrorizing them. Goku beats up the cronies, but the boss Toninjinka, or the Caratizer Bunny, turns people into carrots with his touch. He transforms Bluma, Oolong runs away, Yamcha and Puar are forced to step in to help, and Goku punishes them by taking them to the moon to make mochi, which is a Japanese children's story similar to the man on the moon. It's a cute little side story that I like. There's nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't have much bearing on the plot, aside from Yamcha and Puar being forced to team up with Goku for the first time. Even the Hoi Poi capsules Bluma buys are aren't ever used. But an interesting note is that it kind of looks like Goku is climbing the Nyoibo to the moon, which seems to contradict its later uses where it just carries him upwards. With one ball to go, we finally reach our end boss, Pilaf. I love Pilaf. Yamcha and Puar are recurring villains in this arc, but Pilaf becomes the first recurring villain throughout multiple parts of the series. Always comically inept, always full of self-importance, and somehow always able to maintain a stable of two minions despite always failing. This is the only time the little ninja fox guy is called Soba, but he will later be renamed. The female minion has no name in this arc, but we'll get one next time we see her. Later on when the TV series was being made, Pilaf and company had a larger role, and the staff needed these characters to have names. So Toriyama named them Shu and Mai after Shu Mai Dumplings, with no one remembering that Shu was already called Soba. So for the subsequent appearances, he used their new names, but that wouldn't have any bearing on the manga until near the end of the Red Ribbon Army arc. So Soba and Lady destroy the car and steal all the luggage, including the Dragon Balls. And this is also the first appearance of a mecha in Dragon Ball, another device that would see a lot of use in early parts of the series. But Goku still has his Sushinshu, or Four Star Ball, so not all hope is lost. But Yamcha and Puar must team up with him now, and Yamcha must put aside his fear in order to make sure the other balls aren't lost. The new team is then captured by an all-too-simple trap, but when Pilaf tries to sexually torture Bluma, it shows just how immune to such things she's become over the course of his journey. And granted, it's really prudish, but I'll go ahead and say it's character development, just because. After gassing them, they find Goku's Dragon Ball and summon Shenlong. Shenlong is surprisingly a loose analog of Shuan Song's horse, or rather a dragon prince, who has taken the shape of a horse. Unsurprisingly, it is Yamcha who has to remind Goku to use a Kamehameha to blow a hole in the wall, Nulong and Puar transform into bats to escape. And as Pilaf is about to wish to rule the world, our story reaches a climax, by Oolong wishing for a gal's panties just in the nick of time. Of all the payoffs in Dragon Ball, this has to be the finest, the funniest in the series. After being forced to come along and abused all the way, perhaps deservedly so, it is the self-serving Oolong who gets his wish and also saves the day. But they're captured again, this time in a steel-walled, glass-ceiling room certain to cook them when the sun rises the next day. And Bluma also lets them know that the Dragon Balls become stone for a year after being used. For his part, Goku doesn't seem too upset that Bluma had been lying to him about being able to keep his grandfather's last possession. Puar staring at the full moon for comfort reminds Goku of a monster that comes out during the full moon. The others think he's making it up, but Goku asserts that this monster killed his grandfather, but that Goku was asleep the whole time and that his grandfather had warned him not to look at the full moon, but that he did anyway, that night just before he fell asleep. So everyone's figured out by this point, Goku is the monster, and after a brief fake-out, he does transform, but at least he frees them and takes care of Pilaf. 
when Bluma is trapped, Yamcha can finally put that knowledge of Goku's weakness to use. And just for good measure, he has Puar turn to a pair of scissors and cut off the tail, which just happens to be a good idea as it returns Goku to his normal state. That that worked seems to be a little contrived, as for all he knew, it would just remove the pesky weakness and let Goku rampage all night with no means of stopping him. Kind of like what we'll see later in the series. But thankfully it worked. The next morning, they all make a pact not to tell Goku that he was responsible for his grandfather's death. Goku wakes up and is cavalier about his lack of a tail, but he decides to leave the tray under Kame Senin. Yamcha and Bluma realize that they are made for each other. Well, in reality, Bluma thought he was hot, just like almost every other guy she meets. And Yamcha just met the first girl he managed to not be driven into a catatonic state around. And that's almost like being made for each other. And so years and years of unhappiness will follow. Oh, Yamcha, you poor dolt. So Yamcha, Puar, and even Oolong decide to move to the city with Bluma and never return to their own homes again. As they go their separate ways, and Goku flies off for more adventures, the narration promises that the story will go on just a bit longer. The Hunt for the Dragon Balls is a very, very good arc. It may be slightly derivative and a few elements are flat out ripped from Journey to the West, but it stands alone as a fun, self-contained adventure story. A few of the elements borrowed from Journey to the West go on to become quite different from the source material as the series goes on. It's very much a gag series, and it breaks the fourth wall several times. Pilaf and other characters make direct references to Dr. Slump, Oolong refers to their world as a comic, but best of all is when Goku makes Yamcha literally break the fourth wall by smashing him into the top of a panel. To those of you who like your Dragon Ball series, such gags probably make this arc very much hated, but I think it's hilarious. It also really parodies the idea of an epic quest in a lot of ways. Its ancient wise man is a gushing pervert, the would-be damsel in distress is, well, not the best person in the world. Most of the desired wishes are petty and ridiculous, and the hero is a bit of an idiot who has to be explained that they're in peril before getting him to do anything. While the story is serialized, even from the beginning, each chapter feels like an individual element as well. You can usually read a chapter of this arc and get a mini-story. You don't feel that the story ends just because Toriyama ran out of his allotted number of pages for the week, but because he has told the tale he wants to tell. Furthering that idea is the fact that every chapter opens and ends with a narration box. What is fascinating to me is how many elements seem to work as setups for later on. Goku already admits to being adopted from the very beginning. Kame Senin says that Gohan told him about finding Goku. Chi Chi does come back to collect on her promise. Oolong even wonders if Goku is an alien, and we know for a fact that Toriyama wouldn't decide on that for a few more years. Not only do most of these things not contradict elements later in the series, but you'd almost believe that it was an ingenious foreshadowing if you didn't know any better. Also, I love the art here. I've always preferred the early rounded style to the more angular, over-muscled stuff he'd do later, but it also seems much less lazy than a lot of his later work for the series. There are several nighttime scenes, which means more inking. He uses screen tone on occasion, something he admits to hating for it, taking up too much time. Even the smaller panels have a good sense of detail. The art is something I think definitely takes a nosedive towards the end of the series, so it's great to see it so amazing here. But what I really love about this arc is its characters, particularly the main five, and given that this is Dragon Ball, where later arcs left the majority of the cast exist either to stand around in the background or die to serve the emotional needs of another character, just having the cast be active is pretty amazing. And in fact, they all complement each other pretty well, especially Bluma and Oolong compared to Yamcha and Puar. It won't be the last time Toriyama creates a duo to counterpoint another duo. On the one hand, we have our group of heroes, but they're not exactly loyal to each other. Bluma manipulates Goku, she kidnaps Oolong and drugs him. Oolong is always trying to get away, and he drugs both Bluma and Goku. But on the other hand, Yamcha and Puar are villains who are totally loyal to one another. Likewise, Oolong can only transform for five minutes while Puar does not have that handicap, although I don't believe that's ever mentioned in the story proper, but in supplemental material. Meanwhile, while Bluma and Yamcha have essentially the same wish, and both do underhanded things to get them, the wording is different enough to be relevant. Bluma will wish for a boyfriend, probably some magically created boy toy to do her bidding. Yamcha's not wishing for a girlfriend, but simply the ability to be able to function around girls so that he can get married under his own power, which seems slightly nobler. On the whole, the good guys seem just as bad, if not worse, as the bad guys. You have Kame Senin making deals to sexually harass someone, you have Bluma forcing Oolong to get groped in her place. Yamcha is intelligent and ruthless, but also rather innocent and beleaguered. Oolong is amazing. He's somewhat reprehensible, but almost the straight man to the idiot boy and the selfish girl. He's much more pragmatic despite his lecherous appetite causing his downfall. But at the center of all of this is Son Goku, the only pure character caught in the middle. He's altruistic, and despite being dumb as a stump, he feels like a real kid in a lot of ways. Most of the objectionable content is because of Goku, but it feels like how a kid would act if he was being exposed to the realities of the opposite sex for the first time. He's intrigued not because he's a deviant like half the rest of the cast, but because he's curious. The only problem with him is that he's not really active enough, although I think it works here. 
Later arcs, and even the end of this one where he sets out on his own, show that he's grown past the kind of person who needs to be taken on an adventure by someone else. The only letdown in the cast is Puar, who just is not given much of a personality, other than one in relation to other characters. He's a rival to Oolong and a companion to Yamcha, and he functions well in those capacities, but there's just not enough there. It says a lot where in the scene where the cast is discussing the ramifications of Goku's transformation, the author chooses to have Puar sleeping the entire time. So even in the arc where nearly all the characters are well used, we still have one who isn't. My only regret for this arc is that there wasn't more of it, or at least more of this original core group of five. By the end of the series, only Goku is going to have any kind of important role left. Puar only has one more moment to be useful, and as for Oolong, despite being such an interesting and fun character, he's done. He has nothing left to do for the rest of the series but stand around in the background and occasionally have a funny line. And that's just a shame. But now it's time for the ranking. There are stronger arcs than this one, but as far as being a cohesive story, it's one of the best, and certainly the most fun. Your enjoyment of this arc will obviously depend on if you prefer your Dragon Ball serious or comical, and also very much on how you feel about the kind of humor displayed here. A lot of people just aren't on board with nudity and adolescent sex jokes. However, I find it extremely fun. Its action is good, its story is mostly pretty well focused, and its characters are well used. And for that, I give The Hunt for the Dragon Balls arc a 7 out of 10. Next time, Toriyama introduces a pivotal new character in one of the most lasting plot devices of the entire series in the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai arc. See you there! Nice